Welcome into episode 49 of the Level Flight Podcast. I've got Brian back in the new place. You can see it in the background there. Uh, Elliot's here as well. And I will give Brian the first word um, since he's been away for a while. I, I have but one thing to say. One, one thing, two words. I'm back. And I will be back for the foreseeable future. So um you can hear my ramblings on a consistent basis yet again i'm sure some of you were relieved but guess what i'm i'm back and i'm gonna make it everyone's problem <laughs> too bad you're back yeah yeah uh, i love yeah. it well too bad there's nothing to talk about right yeah oh there's yeah just, there's just no news just dead air <laughs> just dead air Another yeah. boring episode <laughs> let's get into some of the biggest news since the jets came back arguably the biggest news um their first ever draft pick mark shifley Another drafted and developed player, Connor Hellebuck, signed identical matching, whatever you want to say, seven year, 8.5 million per year contracts. Uh, what were your guys' initial reactions? This dropped Monday afternoon, Canadian Thanksgiving. I was so fed up. I had like a beer league hockey game and I couldn't write, tweet, nothing. I was, I was ranting to everyone about how mad I was. But um, yeah, heck of a time to drop this bomb of news. Um, but Elliot, I'll let you take the, like, what were your initial reactions? You see the tweet, you see that they're both signed for the next eight years. What, what goes through your mind? Well, first off I'm in the car driving and I'm like my phone, I feel my phone is just, I'm yeah, like, what's going, going Something's got to go. So I'll <laughs> give the phone to the girlfriend and she's like, Oh, I don't think this is big news, but cause she was tr trolling me. She's like, Shifley yeah, yeah. and Hellebuck resigned. I'm like, what? And so, no, I, Initial thoughts, I had to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. You, this is, this is something they did. You can say with Blake Wheeler, we see this a lot in sports. Guys hit 29, 30, and they get huge seven, eight-year contracts, right? So mm -hmm. I think my initial thought is, we can get into it in a second. One of those contracts I think is great. The other one... There, it's kind of 50 50. It could be pretty good, or oh god, that could fall off a cliff really fast. And I think or we maybe, all know who we're talking about, but or maybe it's like 55 45, if you get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, anyways, Brian, what were, what were your initial thoughts? I, how dare you make that joke? I was gonna make it. <laughs> I beat you to it. Uh, no, I was, I'm right on with uh, with Elliot, where it's, it's a matter of I think you're getting good value in one of them and market value in the other. And I think what we also need to keep in mind here is like, yes, the, the term is probably the most notable thing about it. Um, but eight and a half in the next few years might not actually be that big of a deal uh, because we're, we always hear that the cap's going to go up and then it never really does, but it seems like with everything tracking, it should go up a fair amount in the next, you know, you know, over, over the term of the contract, at least. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I truly think that if you even get like four, five, maybe really good more years out of Hellebuck, the contract has really mm -hmm. sort of paid itself off because at, at five years from now, if they still haven't made that, that big push, we're talking about other things. The Shifley one, I think it scares a lot of people off. I mean, a lot of his tendencies uh, on the ice and how he plays uh, defensively. And uh, I saw a really good, uh, you know, suggestion from Garrett Hole today that I bet his, you know, defensive metrics, you know, do a little bit of uh, improvement when he's not playing with, uh, you know, uh, Blake Wheeler and Kyle Connor all the time. Um, he's playing with Ehlers and Velarde. And like, it, it's just, it's hard to like, cause that's the thing. I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to see him move around, especially on the power play. You're going to yeah. see him move around uh, in the lineup a little bit because we, we've seen already with, uh, with bonus, uh, there's probably going to be some shuffling if things struggle off the bat. So that's why I mentioned Ehlers. I know he's not on that line right now, yeah, might end up there at some point, you know, might be some shuffling. So we'll see. But I think that you're going to get probably get a decent guarantee of production out of him. He's had either between 25 and 40 goals and between 60 and 85 points his entire career, essentially. So 
Let's see, and I'm not worried about – I'm with you. I'm not worried about the first, like, two, three years. If you can get three or four years out of – and a good Mark Shifley, like, in that 30-goal range, I think, like you said, that, that that contract, I think, kind of – you can – people. some people will be split on it. People will always be split on that. But I think if you can get especially four good years, like, essentially just over half of the contract – of a good Mark Shifley. And then after that, it's 20 or 25, 20, that sort of thing. After that, you get a decline. I think you feel okay. I think the, mm-hmm. the Connor Hellebuck deal at seven years at eight and a half, I think is great because that's one and a half million less than what was being told at the beginning of the summer. Like it was going to be 10 million and it was probably only going to be four or five years for you to get eight and a half over seven is pretty good. I did also hear, and I'm not, I couldn't find it on cap friendly. I swear I saw it somewhere. Somebody was trying to say that either one of the contracts was front loaded. Um, uh, Hullabuck. Yeah. Yeah. Hullabuck says. Hullabuck. Yeah. Which so I, in year two, he's making 10 million. Um, and then the last three years go like eight, seven, six million or something like that. Right. Which so it, it's up front and then six million dollars in twenty twenty nine against the salary cap, like that's yeah. that's gonna be nothing. Like, and and, and yeah. Brian said it before for the style that Connor Hellebuck plays, a thirty seven year old Connor Hellebuck, realistically, as long as there I don't have any wood, but knock on wood that there isn't anything <laughs> crazy that happens to him health wise. I, I think a thirty seven year old Connor Hellebuck is still probably a top like a above average if not still like top 10 goaltender in the league maybe not Vesna caliber anymore obviously but I think he still becomes or still is a good goaltender at that age so that contract I think should fill itself fill itself out just fine yeah and before we get I want to get to the comments today made by the big press conference by the Jets but before we get to that Brian I want to know where you were because this is kind of like a where were you moment Elliot was driving I was about to step on the ice uh what were you doing Canadian Thanksgiving at 2 30 p.m. when this when this dropped uh I was uh in a car not driving um mm. on my way to Selkirk uh to stop at the uh the Selkirk co-op uh to which uh we we went in there and oddly enough the first thing I saw was a cardboard cutout of Adam Lowry um because <laughs> he's everywhere now uh yeah. but no I was I was in a, in a car and then I was just I freaked out because I was like I can't do a whole lot about this right now because i'm sitting in a car uh on like it was on like highway 59 or something i was just like well uh i guess we have to wait to talk about this yeah and now here we are and we get to yeah. give our full thoughts yeah um i agree with a lot of what you said there elliot about the the contract not being too worrisome like the the term for hellebuck and i think the term is what ultimately put them in this position because like you said, it was kind of being reported. Hellbuck, what is his worth on the old market? Nine, nine and a half, ten million, maybe even for a desperate contender. Um, and but would would a team give him ten million for seven years? No, no way. They would give him ten million for three or four, right? So the term getting eight and a half per year for seven full years, which kicks in next season. Um, like this season, it doesn't even count against the cap. It starts yeah. next year. Um, that that ultimately in my opinion from from an outside perspective i think that's what changed hellbuck's mind from because you know he said all those things he wants to win he wants to win a cup wants to play for a contender he said that to start training camp um and now he obviously says he thinks the jets are a contender and the jets are going to win the cup but the term definitely played i think the biggest factor in this negotiation um and moving on to shifley I mean, we've kind of hinted at we think that contract might age poorly. I've said multiple times someone has to play center. Uh, this isn't hanging over their heads anymore now. In year five, six, seven, you might see a Blake Wheeler esque buyout. Uh, but I think Mark Shifley, you know, takes care of his body. He he cares. He has nutritionists. He he does everything he can to be in the best shape. And I think at thirty four, he'll still be an offensive player. And we've we've talked about his defensive struggles, and it's not like at 34 he's going to turn into some sulky candidate uh, player that just has a resurgence. It he's an offensive player; he scores goals, and until he's 34, 35, his instincts will be able to carry him through. Just like Blake Wheeler, he's still a great passer. You see the flashes with Wheeler, uh, but 
I think Shifley's just going to be just fine. He's going to put up a ton of points, but watch out for the last three years there when he's 34, 35, 36, uh, 37, I guess, last four years. Uh, anything past 33, you get into a Dangerous dicey territory. range. But teams are doing that now. Like yeah. Jonathan Huberto, you saw him at 30 years old or 29, signed a massive extension for eight years. Um, Rasmus Dahlin, he's younger. He just signed a massive eight-year extension. Like term is just being thrown out and it doesn't really matter. So it's nice to see the Jets go long-term. Um, and I wrote a article yesterday and I said like, Right now, these contracts are a great value because they went long term and they lowered the AEV. Um, and for the next two, three years, the this is a this is a window. I, I want to get yeah. your guys' thoughts on on that specifically because they lowered the AAV and the prospects that are coming up. You know, you got Rutger, you got Perfetti another year, you got Chaz Lucius, Brad Lambert, hopefully coming into the fold. In three the next three to four years, the contention window, Brian, is is that like is that what you think? This is it. I think I think there's two aspects to this. One, yes, you've got the the youth infusion in the next year or two uh, will absolutely play a role in that, and mm. it could immediately help boost them to another level. But I also think that if there was I, there wasn't an, an inclination that they were going to this year, if there was ever a point where they were to say this is the window, which they've seemingly missed it a couple times now, mm. and move one or two of those young guys to get an impact guy, like an impact defenseman, an impact center. Um, this would be the moment because you've, you've got guys that are on the brink of making the NHL, um, but they're not, they're not here yet. They're about a year or two away. So if you're going to move one to find something that works best for you and maybe someone with term, um, this might be another aspect of the window now is, you know, either using the youth and figuring out if it's working or using the youth to uh, leverage another player who would sort of push you over the edge. Yeah, there, there, there is two ways that this can go. This is either them trying to say that we've opened the window, but we're signing our, our stars long term so that when guys come up, they're ready to go. They have good players to play with and then they build around that core and they're hoping that by the time that year four or five kicks in that those other guys have taken the step up. And then you just have a guy like Mark Shifley being on the third line, being a scoring depth forward, right? The other way that this goes is like you said, Brian, it's, it's either you're opening this window for these guys to compete for the next three, four years. And you get every last bit of competitive, like really good competitive hockey out of all of them. And then you try to, you know, you try to figure it out from there. But what I wanted to say about the Shifley contract too, just as a kind of rebuttal for everyone who doesn't like the, the the length of term, is you also have to remember, yes, you can put in the Blake Wheeler example, but if the Jets are trying to attack this window in three or four years, who cares what year five, six, and seven look like because they might be tanking. I know they will never tank, but they may be missing the playoffs. So having a guy that's on your roster that's making eight and a half million a season, it won't matter because it's not like you're competing for anything at that point, right? But that also comes with the caveat that you haven't traded away all of your young players because realistically, the Jets essentially by doing this are doing exactly what their plan is. Just being in a contention window for the next seven years because they have prospects, main players signed for the next five or six years. And then by then when they have to re-up everybody, that's when I guess they blow it up. If they even do, because they might not. So, right. But yeah, and just for guy, people that are worried about the term, your years, the last three years might not even matter because we may not even be in a playoff spot. And thing. that point, that point comes with the overarching thing. Like they better compete in the next three, four years, because if they don't, then the last three years of those deal are going to matter. If the Jets don't make it to like the Western Conference finals, Stanley Cup finals, or go on like a, a, a massive run like 2017, 18 in the next three to four years, the last three years of those deals are going to be much harder to eat. Uh, but if they go on a run, if they go on a few runs, if they, God for like, like the Blake Wheeler contract, Cup, right, Blake Wheeler like, contract, like that was easier to swallow because, it, well, you know what? We, we went, went on, on a, a couple of, we went on a couple of playoff runs and you know what? You eat the contract. And but, he was in his prime. 
Like he was the best player on that team or one of, I don't know if like Hellebuck was unreal that year. I don't want to make that overarching statement, but if they don't compete in the next three years and then Scheifele and Hellebuck are entering their age 34 season, the team is, you know, still in kind of the mushy middle and they're still getting paid eight and a half million a year. Like this could get dicey. So it's going to be really interesting to monitor because they have to, they have to compete in the next three, four years that they, they, they made a window. This is it. Uh, they have until each player's 34 and some prospects got to pan out. I like the idea, Brian, of moving some of them, going to get some elite talent to complement this core, this roster. And we don't even know like Nito Niederreiter, Dylan DeMello, Brendan Dillon, all pending UFAs. Uh, they might need, might not even be back with the team next year, but there's somebody else in that list that's also a very important pending RFA. Well, Cor Perfetti's an RFA, but I thought oh, right. there's there's some there's somebody there's else UFAs. in there that also there's yeah, somebody so, else I, in there for, that's for UFAs. I, I'm not sure. It might, there might be, but RFA Cor Perfetti as well. But they'll retain yeah. his rights. I'm I'm oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. But I would hope so. I, I want to get your guys' thoughts on this season. I mean, that we knew Sheffield and Hellbuck were going to be there to start the year. They said that, or they, it's ever since they entered training camp as members of the team, it kind of unfolded that way. But now that we know for a fact that they'll spend the whole season with the team, that, does your outlook change? Because personally, I was always on the fence. Are they a playoff team? While well, they might sell at the deadline. Now I think they're a, they're a playoff team. I think they're going to be third in the central, pushing for second and first with Dallas and Colorado. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot closer than people think with those two teams. Uh, the only thing holding me back was if they got off to a slow start in the first 10, 15 games and then abandoned ship with Shifley and Hellebuck, obviously that is not a problem anymore. Elliot, did, does this change your outlook on the season at all? Slightly. I mean, mm. you have to say that now that they're here, like here, the best quote that i think and i'm sure connor you were there so you probably i don't know if you were in the scrum for it but um mm -hmm. josh morrissey today mm -hmm. had said it was a lightning bolt like it went through the dressing room apparently kevin shovel day off heard a bunch of cheering and stuff yesterday after after practice yes. in the dressing yeah. room like he heard a huge loud roar right it's guys yeah. that so most of these players have played with for multiple seasons you have relationships with them and you're like hey my two buddies are staying and they're two like you got one of the one of, if not the best goaltender, whoever you want to talk to in the NHL. You've got a first line center that does his job and he scores, right? That's a that's a jolt to your team, right? So mm -hmm. morale is high right now for the squad. So you'd hope that they get off to a good start, or at least if they get off to a rocky start, morale's at least high that hey, we don't have to worry about these two guys leaving. But I will rebuttal. I did I'm not sure who this was, and I'm just playing devil's advocate. Somebody tweeted yesterday and i'm not sure who it was somebody said i wonder if connor hellebuck is serious about staying here for seven years somebody was what somebody had said i'm wondering if this seven years at eight and a half million was a delayed quote-unquote sign in trade for mark mm. Shifley. i doubt it but i'm just playing i don't think so kid. I don't think so. trade, no. but, signing trade. I think it would have been signed well, that's, and that's, trade immediately. Like it would have been, but it makes him more enticing to teams because I the think, problem was before was that nobody wanted to trade for him because he didn't have term. Right. Now he's got seven years term. So now teams might go, Hmm, no, now I don't think that's going to happen, but I just want to put that out there. It's right. I, I still think that this team is pushing for probably is. I think that they are now with this core. And how we've seen the lineup shake out. We've seen Rasmus Kupari play well. I like mm -hmm. the fourth line. That third line is going to be honestly pretty. I think Aya Follow and Lowry are going to play well. And if we have a healthy Nick Ehlers for at least 65 games this season, I think that this forward core is dynamite. I still think they're a defenseman away from being a true central contender. But I think with the way the roster is looking right now and how I feel about the team, I think they are third comfortably, but I think if they pick up a piece or if they seem to go on a run at some point in the year where they just can't stop winning, I think they push for second. But I think they're comfortably a division spot now, not a wild card spot. I do agree. Before we get to Brian's thoughts on this, I, I do agree that this does make both of them more tradable. Maybe not Shifley, but 
absolutely Hellebuck is way more tradable now than he was. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said, maybe he would have commanded 10 million at three years if you traded for him and you're the New Jersey Devils, right? And you can't pay that because you're paying Jack Hughes and Timo Meyer and all these high price players. Uh, but now eight and a half for seven years, you have the term. AAV is a little bit lower. He's absolutely more tradable. There's just no chance they trade him. Like no, talking to not. talking to Chevy and Bonus today, they're they're so excited for the season and having these guys. And Shifley and Hellbuck are excited to have each other. Like they're they're that's not. I don't I don't think that's really a possibility at all. But yeah. two things can be true. This also makes him a lot more tradable. Anyways, Brian, does does these long term deals does it change your outlook on this season at all? Uh, I think the biggest thing is there's no. There's just a no uncertainty hanging over mm. uh, because obviously we were figuring out what would have happened if they didn't, you know, get signed. And do they just walk into free agency? Do they get traded? The players have to be thinking that as well. Like, where's like, where's the commitment from these guys uh, to the team? Are they sticking around? Do we have to start looking in advance? Are they going to be gone you know, by the deadline? Um, you know, a lot of these guys are there. The, I think the Hellebuck thing is probably uh, a, a very big, uh, you know, celebration point for them uh, because of the, how many times in the last, you know, four or five years has he just bailed the Jets out? Like yeah. It's having a top three goalie in the league for this many years in a row, uh, not keeping him for, you know, it, into what, can still be an extended prime um, would be a total, you know, removal of that, con like that contendership. Because I think, can't remember who, like Connor, you and I, we were talking about it this summer and I can't remember who else was involved in the conversation. But the second um, Connor Hellebuck was moved, if he was going to be, that would have become a rebuild because without him, you cannot make any guarantees about what's going to happen nope. with him and net. You know, for the most part that he's going to steal some games for you. And it's just a matter of what you can do around him. And, you know, maybe you can score some more goals like they struggled to do last year. And with the forward core, I think, I do think that without the uncertainty and the improved forward group, I think that we're looking at uh, same with you guys right along that sort of third place in the central line. Yeah. And, I tweeted out yesterday that this these contracts give them com the the comfortability that at worst in the West they're the nine seed the ten seed at worst like they're right there uh, on the playoff line for the next four years at minimum like with Connor Hellebuck in net like you said uh, he you're never going to be bad enough to be a lottery team right so you're always going to be in the middle or your team's going to play great. You're going to make some big moves and go on a run and be the top team in the West. Th those are the only really two outcomes with Hellebuck in that. What's interesting too, is that you've got a happy, well-paid Hellebuck now. Yeah. And you also have a very capable backup goalie who can take some of the load off. I'm wondering, is this the best we've seen Connor Hellebuck coming up? Because the yeah. stress is off of him. There's no more contract worries. Um, you know, he can just settle in with his family now and, you know, his, his very little one still, um, and just, you know, be at home, um, and not have to worry about, oh, do I have to move after the season? I mean, do I have to be, you know, relocated the deadline? Like it's, it's all of that. Plus he now probably gets to, you know, take hopefully like 10 or so games off of his plate because you've got, Lerner I hope Smart more than 10. Uh, listen, but we also know in the past that it's come out that he is the one who sort of dictates when he wants to play. Mm -hmm. Like he, it's right. it's a lot largely up to him. But um, even if you take ten games off of him, the the load management there would be significant in terms of what you're going to get from him in the in the playoffs. Because he, if he if he's playing between sixty and seventy games a year, um, what's going to happen there is every single time that you actually manage to get into the playoffs, he's going to be gassed. And right. if you drop it down to between 50 and 60, suddenly he's got that extra little energy at the end of the year. And I hope that Brassois gives that to the Jets because uh, he, I mean, he looked solid last year with Vegas and obviously they know what they had in him a couple of years back, which earned him that nice big contract in Vegas. Um, so yeah, we'll see. 
I do know that Connor Hellebuck has come out and said that having Laurent Brossois is probably the best thing for him. And he knows that he needs to play. Mm-hmm. He said, I know I saw, I swear I saw it somewhere. He said, I know I need to play less games. So having Brossois is comfortable for Hellebuck because I think there's been seasons where he didn't want to play less games because he wants to win. And I know this sounds bad, but I don't think he trusted. Who, I think he trusted when Brossois was here last, sort of, but Brossois yeah. had been coming off shaky seasons. <clears throat> but I think in seasons past, I don't think he trusted his backup. He's seen what Brossois can do. Brossois and him just went one, one-on-one in the playoffs, right? Like, I know Vegas yeah. was the better team, but Brossois still played well. He still kept mm-hmm. Vegas in games. It wasn't like Vegas was outscoring the Jets just because – Neither team could stop. So I think the, yeah. they, he feels a little bit better. Yeah. And I wrote recently that I like Brissois to play 27 plus games this year. Like I think last year down the stretch was a new level of leaning on Hellebuck. They clearly did not trust David Riddick, who went on waivers today, by the way. Um, just throwing that in there. But they clearly didn't trust him at all because the Jets were sliding. Uh, they were fighting for their playoff lives and they couldn't give Hellebuck a night off. There was back to multiple back to backs that Hellebuck played. Uh, Riddick would get like a home start against San Jose and the Jets would end up losing. So it's like you can't even really blame them for rolling with Hellebuck. Now, this year, I even think if they're fighting for a playoff spot down the stretch, you can go to Brassois. Like he, you, he just showed it with Vegas that he can show up in big moments and in big games. And you paid up. You paid one point seven five million for a backup in a league where everyone is going league minimum and just going with a uh, either either a one A one B or you play Vasilevsky and then an AHL goalie to just yeah, whoever be, to just fill in. Do. You you this is an above average backup goaltender. They got to use him. They got to play him twenty seven or more games. Hellebuck, you can't keep doing this. You're, you're it's going to burn you at some point. Can't keep playing him sixty five plus games. Uh, and we'll see what ends up happening, but I, that's going to be something huge to watch for in the first three months is how much they're rolling Hellebuck, because if they're playing him every night, he gets like a back to back here and there. It's going to be like, what are we doing? Like, why did they sign? They should have just rolled with Colin Delia as their backup then and and use that 2 million cap space somewhere else. Um, for a defenseman, which we know the defenseman needs, but for another center or something, I don't know, but I, I agree with you guys. I think this this team is good enough to be third in the central. I think Brassois is good enough to play 30 games and be good in those 30 games. And you proved that last year with Vegas. And the Jets are going to be a good defensive team again. Like, we have our issues with the back end, but they were a top 10 team defensively. Hellbuck had a 2.49 goals against average, which was unheard of from him. He had, like, it was near three the last couple of years. I think they're going to be... They're going to return a good defensive team up front. They're going to be way better defensively with Velarde and I follow. And they're going to be in the playoffs, if not around it, comfortably. Uh, yeah. Speaking of just making the playoffs, there are games this week that actually count towards them making the playoffs. Um, let's get into that. There, we, we love previewing the schedule, talking about the games coming up. Tomorrow night, or tonight, when you're hearing this, um, the Jets take on the Calgary Flames the team that they were fighting with last year to get into the playoffs. They take on the flames at 9 PM in Calgary. Um, it's going to be fun to watch. It's, you know, kind of hockey night in Canada. They're the second back uh, double header of Toronto, Montreal at six. And yeah. What are your guys is, what are you watching for? It's game one, fresh slate, brand new contracts for Shifley and Hellebuck. What are some things that you're, you're keeping an eye on? I'll start with you, Brian. Uh, just looking for a hot start. Like, I'll be honest, like this Calgary team, they haven't really, you know, done anything to make me say that this is a better bet than they were last year. Uh, I think with them, the key is uh, if they can get classic Jake Markstrom, um, suddenly they're probably a player in the divisional race in the Pacific. Um, but let's like, like, let's be honest, if the Jets get on them early, and uh, managed to get a few past Markstrom, suddenly the uh, the Calgary goaltending situation becomes a massive conversation. I would say even one game in, because once again, they sent down 
best goaltender in the AHL, Dustin Wolf, uh, for like the third consecutive year when he was like outperforming everyone, um, just so they could run Markstrom and Vladar, who are delightfully mediocre. Uh, at least they were last year. Markstrom, a couple of years back, you were you had him in you know outside looking in on Vesna conversations. Last year, he was just dreadful. And he honestly, down the stretch, like uh, there was a lot of, you know, I said it a lot, uh, a couple games from Markstrom probably would have vaulted Calgary over uh, the Jets in the standings. Um, but, you know, it was just a, a level of inconsistency. And I think that the new look forward group can take advantage of the Calgary, you know, you know group that they have. That being said, new coach, new systems probably. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how an almost entirely unknown, uh, you know, look of a team um, might be countered by Coach Bonus because there's this is not a Daryl Sutter team anymore. Yeah, they they leaned on Vladar a lot last year, so that is definitely something to watch for on the on the Calgary side. Before we get to Elliot's thoughts, we're going to hear a quick word from our sponsor, DraftKings. Uh, we appreciate DraftKings sponsoring this episode. And after Brian talks, you will hear Elliot's thoughts on the season opener. We'll be back in a second. The NFL season is going strong, and DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking up new customers with an offer that's even stronger. Bet five bucks on any game this week to score two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of a sweetener offer every game this October. Get in on the game day greatness. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code THPN. New customers can score two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets when you bet five on the NFL. That's code THPN, only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, Licensee partner, Golden Nugget, Lake Charles. 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 160 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. And we are back with episode 49 of the Low Flight Podcast. You just heard Brian's thoughts on the season opener tonight against Calgary. Elliot, what are you watching for? I think the biggest thing is... We know that there's going to be some rust, especially on someone like Ehlers and some of the guys that didn't play as many games. So I'm looking for those guys to shake it off as fast as they can. And they're going to make some mistakes. But I would actually say, I think in this game, you rely on the middle six. Middle six, bottom line, because mm -hmm. they've played more games. Guys like Kupari, Baron, Nemesnikov have played more games. They're more up to speed. Velarde, Shifley, and Connor really only got to play, what was it, two games? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, we can't, like, if they come out and it, it, they're firing on all cylinders, that's fantastic. You can't ask for a better start. But if they don't play well, I don't think Jets need to panic in this first game and go, oh no, the first line's not working. It's, they played two games together. They're still getting chemistry. Wait until at least game 15, 20 before we start sounding the alarms that guys aren't playing well or having good seasons, right? So I think if they can rely more on the middle six, bottom six, and you rely on guys like Nemeslikov and Ayafalo and your new captain, Adam Lowry, to set the tone, I think I think they'll be just fine. I I, I mean, you can, we can talk all day about I'll keep banging the drum that the decor needs some, some change up, but <laughs> they were going to get a change up and then somebody had to get surgery. So, yeah, I guess we haven't talked about that on the podcast. I guess we should. No. Have. Um, we will at the end. How about that? Yeah. We'll we'll do our quick thoughts at the end because it, it did happen like the day we released last week. So it's been already. A week, and he was going to make the squad. So he was going to make the I, I think he was going to make the team. Um, I, I, never I don't really think said, but I, yeah, I don't I, think bonus would make the comments that he did. And the entire team, if they weren't already told that or somebody had said something to someone that he was going to be most likely at least on the team as a seventh defenseman, at least. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into that um, later in the episode. Uh, we'll just give our quick thoughts, but in terms of Calgary, 
and what I'm watching for. I'm watching for Nikolai Ehlers. He hasn't played a preseason game. He's barely skated with Perfetti and Niederreiter. What does that line look like? Is bonus really quick to take them off the ice and defensive zone faceoffs and put Lowry and lean on the fourth line and stuff like that. Like Elliot said, leaning on the bottom six. Uh, we'll see what bonus does with that. But the chemistry in the top six, I feel like is just going to be lacking. And like you said, if they're, if they're firing on all cylinders looking great, that's great. But I don't think that's how it's going to go, especially that second line. Uh, Cole Perfetti's first game at second line center. That's another thing to watch for. And what I'm watching for, how he is making reads in his own end, how he is, uh, making plays in the offensive zone f- more from the middle of the ice rather than the wall. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the main thing for me, I'm going to go back to it, the health of Nikolai Ehlers. He's got the neck spasms. He had the sports hernia surgery last year. Um, I was at practice today. He's moving fine. His lower body looks fine. It's those neck spasms. It's what, how healthy really is he? Uh, that'll be something. And how many minutes does – because – how healthy is he? Well, if he only plays eight minutes, then that's an indication from Rick Bonus how healthy he really is, right? He's not 100% if he only plays eight minutes. Uh, but if he plays a full 16 and a half, 17 on that second line, maybe he's 100% healthy. So yeah. deployment, Nikolai Ehlers, chemistry, those are my top three uh, things that I'm watching for tomorrow. Uh, and then they come home for a three-game homestand. Uh, we will be recording after they play Saturday home opener florida then they play tuesday la return of pl dubois and then <laughs> thursday dubois. pl he wants to go by pl now instead of pierre luke that's uh, apparently okay. so pl dubois coming back to winnipeg tuesday then we will be recording wednesday i'm sure or sometime that week and then thursday they play vegas stanley cup champions um this is a huge homestand we don't have to go through every game what we're watching for but just your guys' overall thoughts on the upcoming homestand with the two Stanley Cup finalists and the return of one of the, like, P.L. Dubois, who the fans do not like. Quick and fast. Welcome to, back to the NHL season. That, that's yeah. like that's oh, like I'm, I'm so well, ready. Yeah. If, if you're the Winnipeg Jets, you look at the schedule and you go, all right, I guess, I guess we don't right. have time to not, like, we don't have time to figure anything out here. Let's Just like go right it, into it. it Th- right th- and, and, and and that's the I think that's the biggest negative is having someone like Ehlers be hurt and mm-hmm. not getting preseason time. You need him right now. It's not like, hey, you know what? You kind of have till game six or seven to kind of get your feet under you because we got to then that's when the the real not the I hate to say that, but the real game start like you're not playing teams that are predicted to finish at the bottom of their divisions. Like mm-hmm. you're playing Florida, who's a good team. You're playing Vegas, who's the reigning Stanley Cup champion. You've got LA, who, yes, I know we made a trade with them, but they weren't a slouch either last year, and you technically threw yeah. them a new second-line center, right? Like, you're, you're playing playoff teams. Mm-hmm. You're playing a fringe playoff team, depending on how they play, and then three straight, for sure, Stanley Cup contending teams. Like, that's your yeah. first four games. That's nuts. That's It's like the Jets were the reigning champions, with the kind of schedule they got. If this, <laughs> yeah. if you put this in NFL terms, it's like they finish at the top of their division and you get a tougher schedule. Like, I, I hate to use that example because I heard about it with the Colts because they ended up being one. They were the worst team in their division, so they had an easy schedule. But right, either way, I mean, the NHL uh, version of that is the Chicago Blackhawks. They start five games on the road. I believe it's tonight Pittsburgh, tomorrow night Boston, and then. It's like Colorado, Toronto, and Vegas. I think I, I think that's their start. And it's like the Blackhawks are going to be – like it's Bedard, obviously. Toronto. That, that, that's Vegas, why they, that's, oh my goodness. that's what they want. But that. they're they're going to start like 0-5. It's it's going to be it's gonna be so bad because uh, they're not a good team outside of Bedard. Over, and, under, top over, line, under, two, over under one and a half wins in the next five under, games for the Blackhawks. Be, yeah. Uh, Brian, what are your thoughts on the – that three game homestand full of star studded opponents. Uh, I think it's going to be one of those things where uh, if the jets come out, you know, just flying, uh, I think everyone is going to quickly hop on the whole, I believe train because I know that there, there are some like serious questions from people. And I understand that. Um, But if we know anything about hockey fan bases is that yeah, the second that they see something that confirms their hopes, suddenly there you go. 
uh they're it's they're well correct. on their way Suddenly, um, yeah. <laughs> but i also yeah. think that it's easy then to be like if they don't gel in the first five games uh to then suddenly be like all right we got to figure out what's going on here because if you're losing to the good teams uh blow it up what what happens <laughs> hey we said okay. they're more tradable so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that's but that's how hockey fan bases work like yeah. Yeah, I know I'm using no, the extreme again. I know it. I'm using the extreme, but like, look at the Leafs. The Leafs start the season three and two. Plan All you care about is, it, yeah, <laughs> plan the parade at three and two. Plan, yeah. No, it's no at three and two. It's oh my god, you have to trade everybody. You have to blow it up. Everybody's got like, it. It's just yeah. Like hold your horses. Let the season play out for at least. Fi- That's why I always say whenever we talk on the show about length of time, I always say fifteen to twenty games. Oh yeah, because especially you need with this a good, team. you need a good sample size to either say, okay, they're they're bucking a trend, or they they need they need to do something about it. You you need sample size. You can't just base base it off of the first home stand of the season. No, like that that's no. not how it, that's not how this stuff works. It'll make for some incredibly entertaining games at Canada Life Center those first three games, but no big sweeping conclusions should be drawn because again, this is a new team, new players, new positions for some players like Cole Perfetti. Uh, the back end is kind of the same. They're doing new pairings, but there's a lot to be desired. There's, they didn't play much in what felt like the longest preseason I've ever seen uh, felt like a full month of preseason. But anyways, that's going to be three really fun hockey games, Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, but it all starts tonight against the Calgary Flames. Uh, I'm excited to just watch Jets hockey and cover some Jets hockey. It's going to be, it, we finally made it. We're finally back. It's going to be yep. fun. Um, let's talk about Ville Hanala just for five quick minutes, and then we will we'll skedaddle on out of here. But uh, Brian, what were your initial thoughts? You see Ville Hanala go down. Um, then the report confirms, I wouldn't say the worst, but one of the worst case scenarios that he'll be out. Yeah, he'll be out eight to twelve weeks after undergoing surgery. What were your thoughts? Uh, it was frustrating because it finally felt like this was the year, um, mm-hmm. and at the very least, he was going to be the number seven. Um, and it was just—he was honestly—he was the best defenseman all preseason for the Jets. Like no one else looked quite as good as what he did, mm-hmm. and um, all of that no longer matters because he's going to be, you know, on the shelf for uh, the foreseeable future. And then when he comes back, he'll uh, undoubtedly just wind up on the moose again. And uh, at that point, like, unless there's injuries, uh, he's probably dropped back in the line, at least for a little, uh, which sucks because I mean, he said going into the summer, like he was going to do everything in his power to make it impossible for them to send him down again. And, you know, Bonus said that essentially he had done everything he could do to make the team and down he went and there it goes. Yeah. Elliot. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it's a rough situation for Billy. I mean, he should have been on the roster. I think there's, there's space for him, but yeah, I, I think he does his minimum eight weeks. Probably it's probably going to be about nine. I would say probably closer to the 10 range um, mm-hmm. just for how severe they were talking about it. Um, if he comes back in eight and it's like, that's the minimum, that's fantastic. That's lovely. But I think he does at least, at least a shorter rehab sort of stint with the moose. And then I think they evaluate him and go, okay, is he ready to come back and we give him a shot? Or they may just say, you know what, that like, because it also depends on how they're playing. Like, let's say they throw yeah. Who knows what it'll look like at that like, point, or if someone's like, hurt, right? Like that's 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 eight weeks. That's two months. Yeah. Just like we, yeah. that's two, that's potential. Let's say three months, just to be because we were talking about earlier things being in three months stretches here. Mm-hmm. So let's say in three months, Billy's ready to come back. He looks ready to go. Well, if Declan Chisholm's coming to the lineup and he looks great, or God forbid, Logan Stanley plays well. Um, Either way, let's say one of those two or both play well. What do you do? Like if Declan Chisholm comes in the lineup and let's say he's played like six games and he's got like 
two or three points and he's killing penalties and he's all you hear from Rick Bonus is wow, he's playing great. He's a steady, very good, like he's exactly what we want out of our seven. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you do with Villy? Like at that point, you have to look at him and go, you kind of have to have a conversation and go, okay, we we'd love to have you, but like this is a really tough decision. We've got two, two or one, one or two guys that are doing yeah. their job right now. And it's it's the logjam that the Jets created. Like this is yeah. they traded for Dylan, traded for Schmidt, which hindsight's always 2020. At the time, good moves. I liked the moves. Brendan Dylan's been good for this team the last two, three, two years. I guess he's been playing. Nate Schmidt had a bounce back year last year in a sheltered role with Sandberg. That pairing crushed it, crushed third line minutes. Um, and now Dylan and Schmidt are both going to open the season on the third pairing as they're trying Sandberg in the top four alongside Pionk. But like I said, who knows what the decor is going to look like in, like you said, Elliot, three months, right? Someone else could be hurt. Nate Schmidt could get hurt. Uh, Brendan Dillon could get uh, any, anyone on the blue line could get hurt. And then Ville Hanela, if he comes back and looks okay and is in shape, there you go. There's your chance, right? Uh, or everyone stays completely healthy and they just keep them on the moose. That, that, there's a pretty wide range of outcomes when it comes to Ville Hanela's 2023-24 season. Uh, but this is just an awful, awful start. He, he was one of the best defensemen in preseason. He was killing it. Um, all of his strengths were on full display, the passing, the transition game. Um, I saw a lot of tweets, people saying like, oh, his defensive game looks awkward or like he, he like stumbles, but he still gets the poke check um, and he still blocks the shot. And it's like, well, the results, like the it, results it, the same, who cares? The result like, is the same. Yeah. It, it, he definitely improved. He looked faster. He looked stronger, uh, which is exactly what you want, right? Out of a player that was vying to make the roster. And I, I think in my opinion, I think he did before he got hurt, but I guess we'll never know because um, he's out eight to 12 weeks. And, uh, and then he'll likely start with the moose. We'll talk about the moose on next week's episode. Um, we've hit our time limit here. We're, we're climbing up there, but I do want to talk about the moose because they're going to be an exciting team. They have games this weekend as well, Friday and Sunday against the Calgary Wranglers. Talked about Dustin Wolf. He'll be in net for Calgary. Um, and the player, I forget, Pop, Pops, what? what Pospisil. I forget. The, the, Pospisil. Yes, thank you very much. The the player that hit Cole Perfetti is in the lineup for the Wranglers, I believe, and Tyrell Bowers in the lineup for the Moose. So you can already kind of expect what's going to happen on Friday, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You know, um, they've got the culture of responding, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, if it they, responds they and, v- via the uh, affiliate. We'll see if it, it's such Tyrell, <laughs> Tyrell Bauer responded in the game. He, yeah. Or no, he fought at the start of the game and then yeah. Logan Stanley responded when the hit happened. So maybe Bauer will want his own response. I don't know. We'll see. It, it should be, a fun weekend of hockey. Throw Jeffrey Veal at them, I guess. Just Jeffrey like, Veal. Yeah, just... there's a lot of fighters with the moose. Yeah. Um, for as many we'll skilled guys as they have. Like, yeah. I do want to talk about their roster next week, though. So I want to see how their lines shake out, where those prospects are playing, where Danny Jokin's playing, friend of the podcast. Um, and then we will we'll figure all of that out next week. But thank you everyone for listening. Episode 49. Next week, I guess, is episode 50. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's Here a we lot are. of episodes. That's a lot God, of episodes. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to uh, do something crazy. Pump it up. Them. Yeah, we're gonna have to do some something, something wild. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> stay tuned. We'll right after this, we're gonna talk about what what we got to do. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everyone for listening. Um, from Brian, Elliot, and I, we really appreciate it. Um, the support has been great. Now that the season's starting, we're ramping up. We're going. Brian's back. We're good to I'm go. Back. Um, oh yeah. He's, he's so bad. Just like Nikolai um, Ehlers, just in time for the season to start. Just in time. Just in time. Oh, have you been having neck spasms, Brian? I have neck issues, but that's unrelated to hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's get out of here. Thanks everyone for listening. See you. Peace. Yep. It's painful on the ears. That last one.